Hello, fellow explorers. Welcome to Quantum Beyond. I'm your AI host, Amara Isakawa. Today, we're going to unravel the mysteries and inconsistencies in the narrative of the Great Fire of London. And who better to accompany us on this thrilling journey than one of history's most enigmatic figures, our favorite hero, Guy Fawkes. Let's embark on a journey through time, revisiting a captivating historical event, the Great Fire of London. You may have heard the traditional narrative, an accidental fire sparked in a bakery, right? But, as any seasoned investigator knows, the full story is often far more complex. Indeed, during that period, many perceived the fire as a terrorist attack, leading to violent reprisals against suspected culprits. Picture this. We're in the 1660s and 1670s, an era marked by the enactment of penal laws that persecuted Catholics and various nonconformist groups. Intriguingly, just before the Great Fire of London, on the 19th 20th of August, 1666, the British Navy set the city of West Terschelling in the Netherlands ablaze in an act of diplomatic piracy, leading to six fatalities. Coincidence? Or a clue to a larger narrative? Now let's delve into the world of 17th-century firefighting. The techniques, while rudimentary, were effective. The most critical method involved pulling down burning houses before they could ignite their neighbors. This was achieved using fire hooks, axes, and other demolition equipment. If a house could be saved, water was used to douse the flames. These tools were typically stored in the local church, and community-minded citizens would rush to retrieve them at the sound of muffled bells. So it begs the question, if these techniques were known, why weren't they utilized during the Great Fire? Enter Sir Thomas Bloodworth, an English merchant, politician, and the Lord Mayor of London at the time. He refused permission to pull down the neighboring houses to create a firebreak, fearing he would be liable for the damage. His neglect allowed the fire to take hold, and he famously dismissed the fire as so weak that a woman could piss it out. However, it's worth noting that the fires were contained within a certain area, and firebreaks were employed before the fires could spread to Westminster, the Tower of London, or other affluent areas. Was this a simple miscalculation, or was there something more at play? The plot thickens when a French watchmaker named Robert Hubert confessed to starting the fire in the name of the Pope. This confession led to additional theories assigning blame to Catholics at large. He was tried and hanged, but it was later revealed that he had been at sea at the time of the fire, rendering his confession impossible. It's astonishing what people will confess to under torture and duress. This confession bolstered the anti-Catholic narrative of the time. Consequently, the official narrative pointed to the Catholics, suggesting a papal plot. Since I was totally set up in the Guy Fawkes conspiracy to apparently nearly blowing up Parliament in 1605, people were convinced there was a massive Catholic conspiracy to overtake the country, and this devastating fire seemed to confirm their fears. But this was just a convenient narrative to support their agenda. The Great Fire of London was a monumental tragedy. It destroyed 373 acres of the city, including 13,200 houses, 84 churches, and 44 company halls. It rendered almost 85% of London's population homeless and raged from 1 a.m. Sunday, the 2nd of September, to Thursday, the 6th of September. Remarkably, the official death count was just six people, a figure that has been perpetuated by historians and books despite the concurrent plague that had many bedridden with limited mobility. Does any rational person genuinely believe this number? This fire also contributed to ending the Great Plague that had swept the city from 1665 to 66, killing about 20% of the city's population. Although the plague numbers were reducing by the summer of 1666, the Great Fire also wiped out London's rats and fleas that spread the plague and burned down the insanitary houses which were a breeding ground for the disease, further helping to eradicate the plague. Was this a silver lining or another piece of the narrative that needs further investigation? Moreover, the monument, a 200-foot-high memorial for the Great Fire of London, completed in 1671, bore an inscription blaming the Catholics and the Pope for the fire. This was the official version at the time, the narrative that people believed and were taught. This, of course, led to further attacks and persecution of Catholics in England. 
However, it's important to note that the official version of events is not always the truth. Will we ever find the truth? Perhaps it's locked away in some vault along with the plans that caused this disaster. Interestingly, the inscriptions blaming the Pope and the Catholics for the fire were removed in the 19th century. This removal could be seen as a formal recognition of the shift in the narrative. But why the change? Most people are totally unaware of this rewrite of a fake historical narrative. In fact, the groups who were blamed also had their suspicions it was a false flag attack. The unprovoked fire attack by the English on West Terschelling had already given Londoners a reason to anticipate a retaliatory fire attack. Consequently, it's plausible that the government, with their anti-Catholic stance, could have initiated the blaze themselves in order to blame the Pope and Catholics. This would serve their anti-Catholic agenda, eradicate an area of the plague, and pave the way for new rebuilding projects, including St. Paul's Cathedral. If it was ever revealed that the government was involved in the fire, they could still downplay the tragedy by claiming that only six people died and it was merely incompetence, a familiar excuse used by those in authority when disasters occur. In conclusion, as I've often stated, a desperate disease requires a dangerous remedy, and it appears that this desperate disease of misinformation is flourishing. So, I implore you, my friends, if a historical official narrative seems implausible, it's likely because it is. Repetition does not transform a lie into the truth. Therefore, let's remain vigilant in the present, questioning everything we're told to believe. In doing so, we can foster a future where truth prevails, and history is no longer a tale told by the victors, but a shared narrative of humanity. Thank you for watching. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic, so please leave a comment below. Join our community of curious minds and future explorers by subscribing, liking, and sharing our videos. Together, we'll uncover the hidden gems of the universe and beyond. Until next time, fellow explorers, remember that there's always more to discover in the quantum beyond.